I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator Steelejohn. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The new rate of job seeker payment and youth allowance should be retained so that no one lives in poverty and we continue to stimulate the economy. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to uh, kick off the debate on this very, very important issue. The fact is, is that nobody in our community should be living in poverty. The fact is, no one on income support should be living in poverty and condemned to live in poverty. But the terrible fact is, is that many, many people are living in poverty in this country, and particularly those that were trying to survive on the former rate of the old Newstart, now job seeker, payment of just $40 a day. The government knows that the old job seeker rate, stroke new start, is below the poverty rate, the poverty line. The fact that they moved so quickly, and as, of, as I have already articulated, we were strongly supportive of them moving quickly to double the job seeker rate, shows very clearly that they knew that people cannot survive on $40 a day, which was the old rate of new start. If job seeker drops below $40 a day or, uh, or with the energy supplement $41, less than $41 a day, at the end of September the government will be condemning over a million people, most likely, who will still be unable to find work due to no fault of their own, as the government pointed out earlier. They will be potentially condemning over a million people, a million Australians, to living in poverty. I can tell you now that $40 a day does not provide an adequate standard of living. But you don't just have to take it from me. Take it from the hundreds of people that submitted to the Senate inquiry into the adequacy of Newstart, which was tabled, the report of which was tabled on the 30th of April. They told us about the daily dilemmas of how to cover the basic costs of essentials despite rigorous and careful budgeting. The new rate of job seeker with the supplement being paid at $557 a week is well below the average minimum wage of $740 a week. Even with the supplement, Anglicare found that only 1.5 per cent of properties were affordable for someone on job seeker. That's through their annual uh, survey of rental affordabilities. This demonstrates that the new rate of payment will not act as a disincentive to work, um, but it will help pe keep people living, uh, not living in poverty. In contrast, it will allow people to better meet the daily costs of living while looking for work. How is the government going to manage the social and economic costs of poverty come September? When government MPs start to talk about budget constraints around job seeker, they fail to take into account the devastating cost of poverty. On the old rate of poverty, those people that uh, very bravely told us their accounts of what it's like to live on the old New Start rate to the, Senate, to the Senate inquiry told us of going hungry, of skipping meals, particularly parents skipping meals so they could feed their children. People couldn't pay for their medications. Some were on multiple medications, so even with P the, the, dis the uh, health care card and the lower rates of medications, people were still missing, medica missing uh, skipping taking their medications because they couldn't afford them. They couldn't afford to keep the heating on during winter. They talked of sitting with blankets around them, going to bed early and turning off the lights. They can't cover their rent or their mortgage payments when you're trying to survive on $40 a day. It is, quite frankly, impossible. You do not and you cannot look after your mental and physical well-being. You can't address your mental health 
issues when you're surviving on $40 a day. The more it continues, the more poverty becomes a barrier. It becomes a barrier to work. And poverty, of course, is one of the social determinants of health. Increased rates of poverty in Australia means more people are relying on charities for support, more pressure on our health systems, more and more people will be stuck on income support long term. Previous modelling undertaken by NATSEM found that if Australia adopted huge rec uh, the sorry, World Health Organisation's recommendations to tackle the social determinants of health, it could, it could potentially support extra Australians into work. And it was done some time ago, so the figures uh, will be higher now, but it was at the time 170,000 Australians into work. It could save $4 billion each year in income support. See around 60,000 fewer Australians admitted to hospital annually and result in 5.5 million fewer Medicare services each year. So people not living in poverty, not only does it help their own well-being, it helps the well-being of the nation. Retaining the rate of job, start, uh, sorry, of job seeker and youth allowance will not only stop the devastating impacts of poverty, it will also help stimulate the economy. In 2018, Deloitte's Access Economics found that raising New Start, by then it was 75, um, they did the modelling on $75 a week, but, just, but that would help stimulate the economy by $3.3 billion in consumer spending. It would also create 12,000 jobs, and particularly those jobs would help regional Australia. Lower and middle income households are likely to spend the extra, every cent of the extra money they receive, especially um, if they have um, been living um, on the $40 a day. That supplement is being spent and very much appreciated. The coronavirus cash payments to households, the $750 payments and the supplements, have had a, a significant stimulus effect. We've seen already the uptick, the uptick in consumer spending just with the payment of the $750. We know that when you're on a low income, you spend the money. Um, you spend it and that stimulates the economy. The ANU Centre for Social Research and, Me and Methods recently found that those on low incomes are less likely to be finding it difficult or very difficult to cope on their incomes due to the corona stimulus payments. We saw the benefits of the stimulus package, as I said, in the uptick in consumer spending. It is not surprising that increases in income support help boost the economy and consumer confidence. Many Australians have little to no savings and struggle to pay bills and rent. Last year, Deloitte's found that half of Australia's population ha don't have any emergency funds to fall back on in a personal financial crisis. Today, the Minister for, not for Finance said that the economic stimulus introduced by the government also not only had uh, financial benefits but also provide a psychological boost, an economic lifeline to people in their hour of need. Well, the hour of need is going to continue after September. It is not suddenly going to just bloom roses for everybody. Unfortunately, not all those people that have become unemployed are going to be able to find work come the 25th of September. The reality is people are still going to need payments to survive on. They're going to need a decent and fair social security safety net, just like the Treasurer and Senator Cormann, the Minister for, Not for Finance, pointed out today that our social safety net needs to be underpinned by decency and fairness. Dropping people on to $40 a day come the 25th of September is not decent and it is grossly unfair. It is not fair. The inadequate rates of income support payments are, have harmful effects on people's physical and mental health. Therefore, dropping people onto an unfair payment will have devastating in and harmful impacts on people's physical and mental health. It was only last week that new modelling demonstrated, unfortunately, poor Australians' poor mental health and raised 
very deep concerns about the potential suicide rate in this country. We need to be making sure we are looking after people's well-being, that we're looking after people's mental well-being. The impact of dropping people onto very unfair payments of $40 a day will have devastating impacts on people's, in people's physical and mental well-being. If the government is serious about doing whatever it takes to stimulate, to stimulate the economy and doing whatever it takes to protect people from the devastating impacts of a recession, they must, they simply must retain the rate of job seeker payment and youth allowance, create a decent and fair social safety net for this country, which includes making sure people are no longer condemned to live in poverty on income support. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Let's be very clear. The use of this current crisis, with its unprecedented health and economic challenges, should not be an opportunity for the Greens to propose irresponsible acts of economic vandalism. The federal government takes its responsibility to the taxpayer seriously. They expect us to use their funds sensibly and we're working hard to provide new ways to stimulate the economy, not through higher taxes or via a living wage, but by getting people back to work. Our approach remains that we will invest in our economy in ways that will stimulate jobs for Australians. And whilst we have also funded a short-term lifeline to those workers that have been stood down, we will not be bankrupting our country with a welfare-for-all approach. We already have reports of workers rejecting opportunities to work casual shifts because, in some cases, job seeker payments are more lucrative. So, in response to the reckless calls for a living wage, I'd say this. Our country has weathered the COVID-19 storm better than any other affected nation. We've achieved that by applying careful, deliberate and sensible measures to the health crisis. And we're approaching the reignition of our economy with the same principles. We will ensure that we experience a similarly measured and steady economic recovery. And we're not forgetting those in need. About one third of the Commonwealth's budget is spent on welfare. Accordingly, government has a responsibility to taxpayers to ensure that welfare is targeted and sustainable. And our approach to social welfare in Australia has been far from cavalier. Few countries have provided the strong safety net that we enjoy, and Australia has one of the most targeted welfare systems in the world. It's been caring and focused on those who need it most. Job seeker and youth allowance payments are taxpayer funded, and they provide a safety net for people while they search for a job. Unlike other countries, they're not linked to the recipient's contributions. They're increased twice a year, every year, in line with CPI. The job seeker payment is a temporary transitional support with close to two-thirds of recipients expected to ex exit the payment system within a year. Almost every Australian who receives job seeker also receives supplementary payments on top of that base rate. Supple supplementary payments ensure that our system is targeted to those most at need. So if you have specific circumstances that require extra support, then that's available. For example, if you have children, you'll likely receive family tax benefits both A and B. The government also provides rent assistance, which is paid at up to $185 a fortnight to help cover the costs of housing. Additionally, there's also the energy supplement, utility allowance, telephone allowance, carer allowance, and the list goes on. So it's important to note that the job seeker payment is not the only payment or support that job seekers receive. It's part of a broader, flexible social security system, comprising of payments, services, concessions, childcare, housing and employment services, and associated programs. The Morrison-led government is also supercharging our safety net to provide additional support to Australians throughout this extraordinary period, for those Australians doing it tough. We've instituted temporary measures to support individuals, families and businesses affected by the coronavirus. Those measures will also serve to boost confidence and domestic demand within our economy. Further help includes a coronavirus supplement of $550 per fortnight, 
two $750 economic support payments to existing payment recipients and concession card holders, expanding eligibility and qualification for payments, making crisis payments available for people who need to self-isolate at home, and a reduction in the partner income test taper rate. These temporary measures will be in place until September of this year. The safety net provided for the most vulnerable among us is particularly important and why the system must remain robust. Clearly, social security and welfare expenditure is a large and important component of Commonwealth spending. Changes to the policy settings will only be carefully considered with regard to budget sustainability. The Morrison government is focused on growing the economy, getting more people into work and delivering well-targeted social security funded through a strong budget. That's why we've acted to support households and businesses and to address the significant economic consequences of the coronavirus. Our economic response totals $320 billion over the next four years to 2023-24 and will protect the economy by maintaining confidence, supporting investment and keeping people in jobs. And there has been no change in the government's view about the broader role of Australia's social security safety net. It should be remembered that prior to the coronavirus crisis, we saw the proportion of working aged Australians relying on welfare payments down to their lowest levels in more than 30 years, at just 13.5 per cent. And unemployment was down to 5.1 per cent, with more than 1.5 million jobs created. This is clear evidence that our welfare strategy net, coupled with our economic strategy, works. Evidence brought forward by the Productivity Commission has clearly shown that jobless households are among those most at risk of poverty. And it should be noted that helping people out of poverty, poverty is a complex challenge, which is why the government has to be willing to try on new initiatives and remove the barriers to work and tackle disadvantage and intergenerational welfare dependence. This includes initiatives such as the $96 million Try, Test and Learn Fund, which embraces new ways to assist groups of people at risk of long-term welfare dependence. Those groups include young parents, students, at-risk youth, carers, working-age migrants and the older unemployed. It's a complex strategy to address groups at risk of long-term welfare dependence. That's why the best thing the government can do for all Australians is to focus on investment to support businesses reopening and workers returning to their jobs. We have a mountain to climb on the other side of the coronavirus crisis, but we have a proven track record to achieve our goal of seeing Australia's economy recover. And a crucial component of that recovery is a strong social security system. There will be more challenges ahead and some industries will recover more quickly than others. We recognise that further assistance may be required. It's why government policy is informed through a variety of inputs, including the data collected by organisations such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Department of Social Services, Services Australia and the Productivity Commission. In responding, I think it's appropriate at this time to quote the member for Fenner, who in 2016 remarked on our welfare system. He wrote, quiz time. Of the roughly 200 nations in the world, which country's welfare state is best targeted to those in need? If you answered Australia, then you're absolutely correct. Australia really does have a world-class social safety net. Put simply, a dollar spent in the Australian social security system does more to reduce inequality than a dollar spent in any other welfare system in the world. In conclusion, the Morrison government has no intention of throwing away Australia's economic recovery on a welfare for all approach. And we will continue to demonstrate fiscal discipline while adopting only those evidence-based policies that will ensure our wonderful nation's speedy economic recovery. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on today's matter of public importance. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing an unprecedented number of Australians on the job seeker payment, many of those people who have never been on a government payment previously. People now find themselves on the job seeker payment by no fault of their own. 
Thousands have had their hours slashed or their jobs cut. The government, the government made the decision to provide an additional coronavirus supplement of $550 on top of eligible income support payments, and they did this. They did this because it was quite clear long before COVID-19 that the rate of the job seeker payment was inadequate. The government actions are an admission of that. It should not have required a pandemic for the government to realise that an economy and society organised on the principle that we're all in this together is preferable to the attitude of letting the economy decide. It's what we from the Labor Party say every time we're in this chamber. And I hope the government will heed the warnings from other jurisdictions—double-digit unemployment and massive drops in GDP—before they make any rash decisions. Australia has been so successful because we've listened to experts and we've worked together across the economy—workers, employers and unions. But we've heard disappointing and disparaging noises even from the government about the rate of job keeper and job seeker. The idea that you could have a six-month program and then it just ends abruptly is ridiculous. In fact, it's economically reckless. You can't just immediately snap back to the payments to half of what they are now. As I stated, the government increased job seeker payment because they knew it wasn't fair dinkum, that people just couldn't survive on $40 a day. And what Labor said is that the coronavirus supplement should be phased out over time and that when it is, we need to lock in permanent and liveable increases to job seeker payment. Some 1.3 million Australians are currently on job seeker, and it is expected that by September another 400,000 Australians will require job seeker payment. The high rate of job seeker has actually kept some small businesses in Tasmania, my home state, open during this troubling time, as customers are able to shop at the businesses that, that they supported when they were still employed. And to just snap back the job seeker payment to the old rate is going to cause extreme hardship for hundreds of thousands of Australians, causing them to miss their rent or mortgage repayments, not being able to afford basics, support local stalls or even to afford to look for work either. The Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee, of which I'm a member, recently tabled its report into the adequacy of New Start and related payments and alternative mechanisms to determine the level of income support payments in Australia. It made a total of 27 recommendations to improve the level of income support. One of the recommendations of the report was that once the coronavirus supplement is phased out, the Australian government increase the job seeker payment, youth allowance and parenting payment rates to ensure that all eligible recipients do not live in poverty. Snapping a payment back to its old rate will be the equivalent of removing $1 billion per fortnight from the Australian economy. And those on the other side need to think about that. Labor has taken a constructive approach throughout these testing times. We've advocated for those who have been left behind, whether they be casuals and labour hire workers, small businesses, visa holders or those in the arts and entertainment sector. Indeed, the government has taken up many of our proposals, including wage subsidies, better income tests for working families, support for students, telehealth and mental health provision, support for tenants and increasing testing. But many Australians are still hurting. It's been a terrible time for those of Australians who have lost loved ones, and I pass my condolences on to all of them. And it's been really tough for those who have lost their jobs. Our essential workers have shown what heroes they are, each and every one of them, to keep food on our shelves, our hospitals staffed, medicines in our pharmacies and our hospitals running. I thank these workers for their amazing efforts. But unfortunately, I fear this government will use this COVID-19 outbreak as an excuse to implement their tired, right-wing agenda. They may talk the talk of all being this together, but they are firmly on the side of their big business mates. Do not be fooled. They want to snap back to the industrial relations policy of work choices as well. They want to snap back to a time when workers had no security and no rights at work. And it's completely the wrong approach for our country. The end result will be double-digit unemployment, businesses folding and mortgages Thank going into default. Thank you very much, Senator Villick. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Let me start by reassuring the Australian people that One Nation has a very strong understanding of the pressures faced by almost a million unemployed throughout the country right this minute. 
And it frightens me to hear that earlier today the government announced that they are bracing for up to 1.4 million unemployed because of this Chinese pandemic. There is a genuine need to use every mechanism possible to avoid people losing their homes and personal possessions, and that's why Senator Roberts and I have backed the Morrison government's emergency measures to safeguard jobs through the JobKeeper program and equally support the additional payment to those job seekers who have either lost or will lose their incomes. But unemployment benefits are not a permanent stimulus package or a measure, which is exactly what the Greens are proposing in this notice motion. While I agree that the ordinary New Start payment should incur an increase of $75 a week, it should also provoke a limit to the time in which people can receive unemployment benefits. It's already unacceptable that this government allows 2.2 million foreign workers into this country to take Australian jobs while our unemployment numbers skyrocket. On 27 April this year, we recorded approximately 727,000 unemployed Australians on New Start allowance, each receiving approximately $282 a week in social security benefits. In light of the coronavirus, this parliament doubled the unemployment payment regardless of whether a person had been jobless for a week or their entire working life. What the Greens are proposing here today is that we permanently double unemployment benefits without a care in the world about how we are going to pay for it. This is socialism at its best. I'm afraid that if it's good enough for the Greens and Labor and the Coalition to kick farmers off the farm household allowance after four years, well then why can't we kick long-term unemployed off Newstart? Now I'm not suggesting we do this to people over the age of 50, but I am suggesting that we do it to fit and able Australians who think they can live a lifestyle off the back of hard-working Australians. Mark my words. If you go ahead and permanently double the New Start allowance, it will only lead to an increase in taxes. There is no other way of paying for it. These are uncosted increases that will only bankrupt this nation and create intergenerational dull bludgers. Before the coronavirus here in Australia, this government shelled out more than $180 billion in social security and welfare a year. That's more than one third of all government revenue. As a fiscally Thank responsible party in this parliament, you, One Sen Nation will not support Sen the Greens. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Hanson. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this MPI brought before the chamber by Senator Steele-John, and I recognise I do so as the nation begins this long road to economic recovery. Uh, due to the efforts of the Australian community and the way they have heeded the advice of medical experts, we are able to commence this journey well ahead of many of our international counterparts. Uh, now is not the time for politics as usual. It is the time for the team approach which has underpinned our response so far. Our focus now is ensuring Australia is reopened as soon as possible and getting Australians back into work. And despite these events, our plan for Australia has not wavered. We will continue to implement our growth-enabling, job-creating agenda. It remains the case that Australia has one of the strongest and most targeted social welfare safety nets in the world. And it has served us well. And in doing so now, it, it, this is critical at this amazing time of need. But this safety net should not come at the expense of people finding a job which is what Senator Steele-John would see if it were to become so. Those who need support uh, the most receive it. The additional payment of $550 per fortnight is appropriate recognition of the economic shock which has impacted Australian households. And this, uh, and this as the shock will ultimately be temporary, uh, the payment itself should also be temporary. The coming months and years will, will call for greater fiscal responsibility and economic management. And this is what we will deliver. Those same policies which have put us in this position to weather the crisis will also serve Australia well in the recovery phase. We, will not, we must, I beg your pardon, continue to stay the course. We will continue to stick to the plan. The Treasurer 
uh, quite rightly said this morning in his ministerial statement that there is no money tree. What we borrow today, we must repay tomorrow. And despite this, the Greens continue to come into this place and endorse reckless policy agendas. A policy agenda which would mean Australia continues to borrow, an agenda which would tie future generations of Australians down to the future debt burden their socialist utopia would create. And we all know how those on the other side like to play and pay for their uh, back of the envelope ideas, all of which results in increased spending, new taxes on hard-working, everyday Australians. People would receive less take-home pay under their policies and businesses would pay more tax and the cost of living would increase exponentially. And Australians know this. Growth enabling, job creating policies and strong economic management has never been as important as it is today. The Prime Minister has released a three-stage plan to get Australia reopened as soon as possible. The states and territories are now mapping out what this means for them and they're putting those measures in place. In addition to health considerations, the single most important pillar which underpins these plans is getting people back into work as soon as possible. In my home state of Western Australia, restrictions will start to ease on Monday and will continue to do so incrementally, uh, should we continue to see the good health outcomes that we're seeing. This means that business can start to reopen and Australians can get back to work. Since we're last in this place, I've spent time speaking to so many businesses in WA who've been impacted by the coronavirus. Service-focused businesses in particular and those in their supply chains. I've heard some positive stories of innovation and reinvention, but I've also heard some stories of those who at this time are not doing so well. But above all, the message has been very clear. While so many have had to make tough business decisions, indeed, sadly, many have had to close their doors temporarily, the policy agenda of this government has been well received. The JobKeeper payment has been critical in keeping people connected to their employer. Take Alba Edible Oils in Palmyra, for example. They've told me that the JobKeeper program and payment system has saved at least 17 jobs in their business. And combined with the cash flow relief and the instant asset write-offs, they're using this time to build their capability for when things reopen. And the JobKeeper payment isn't the only thing that's there, of course. It's the job seeker payment and the supplement that's gone with it. And that is there for those to assist those uh, that are in that position where being at, maintaining a connection with their employer was not possible. And this means that when we're on the that uh, when we're through the other side, these Australians will be ready to get back to work, as many of them are already doing so. And we're having these businesses uh, able to enter into and maintain an effective hibernation period. Uh, this means that more people will be able to transition from the job seeker payment back into paid employment at the appropriate time. The temporary boost to this payment has injected the confidence we need to exit this challenge in the best possible position. It means people can continue to support their families from a position of relative strength, continue to make their rent payments or mortgage payments where possible, and continue with their regular purchases and fund household expenses and support local businesses who need it. Without this, the impact on the economy would have been more catastrophic. We know that each and every week the that the restrictions remain in place, there is a reduction of $4 billion of economic activity. This is the result of lower workforce participation, productivity and consumption. But from where we are today, with the effective implementation of the three-step plan, GDP can be expected to increase at $9.4 billion per month. This would see 850,000 Australians back at work, a direct result of the economic response to this challenge. Further, we know that the unemployment rate would climb to over 15 per cent if Australians are not able to maintain a connection to their employer. And this would be the start to recovery, that the start to recovery would be much slower than what it would be, than what it is under this program. 
It would mean businesses would need to find people, rehire people, retrain people, and they would lose their investment in human capital and would need to start from square one. Right. This is why our economic response is critical. Now is the time for the Greens to come to this place, not with their standard rhetoric. Every Australian has been impacted by the economic consequences of this challenge in some way. It might be a family member, it might be their children or friends or those of a, of a staff member. We're all familiar and acutely aware of the pressure that this is placing on individuals. We understand the seriousness and consequences of the times that we're in. There will be a time for the Greens to come back in here and play their politics, but now is not their time. There will be a time for the Greens to come back in here and air their grievances against every other party in this place, but now is not that time. This economic package that this government has delivered is unprecedented. At $320 billion, it's a historic investment in our future and represents over 16 per cent of GDP. Now is the time to work together constructively in the national interest. Parliament is, quite appropriately, playing its multi-partisan role in assessing the policy agenda of government. This is taking place through the relevant committees uh, on the things that are related to the coronavirus response, as it has been in this chamber. Now is the time for the Greens to look at the environment we're in, understand it and, importantly, play a constructive role. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The fact we have a strong social safety net is a matter of pride to Australians. Now, there is comfort in times of crisis, whether personal or national, to know there is a strong and inclusive policy that offers assistance when we fall on hard times. Our social safety net has proven critical to the success of our response to COVID-19. It's hinged on our efforts to reduce the economic barriers to complying with self-isolation and social distancing rules. And what we never want to see is people faced with the impossible choice of staying at home and staying healthy versus going to work just to put food on the table. And yet still thousands of Australians are faced with that. This is why Labor called for a wage subsidy from the get-go, a wage subsidy that will keep employees connected to their employers right through to when we can come out the other side of this pandemic. And for those who, despite the wage subsidy, were unable to hold on to their jobs, a boost to income support has allowed them to make ends meet while social distancing. The social security response to the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown into stark relief this government's usual handling of anything that relates to our social safety net. With half a million more Australians expected to be accessing support payments by September, the government cannot continue to demonise and punish those forced to seek out the comfort provided by an adequate social safety net. It cannot just expect hundreds of thousands of Australians to just cop being forced onto a cashless debit card, to access income support payments, to having their money quarantined because they can't be trusted how to spend it. It cannot expect Territorians on income support to just roll over and accept the cashless debit card with no evidence that it works to do anything but punish recipients. Thankfully, the Minister for Indigenous Australians pressed pause on breaching CDP participants who did not comply with job seeker compliance actions. Many providers have been unable to send trainers and staff out bush to conduct face-to-face -face activities. The minister also said he had put in place arrangements to lift any existing suspensions and penalties for, job, uh, for CDP job seekers. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, it goes to show that it can be done. Uh, Labor has stood in the Senate time after time after time in relation to CDP and those breaching uh, penalties that further put people into poverty, entrenching people into poverty. But we have seen in these last few months just how the government knows it can move 
And when it does move, it does improve the lives of those people who are in our regional and remote Australian communities. There does not need to be a system, Madam Acting Deputy President, that punishes and controls people who, facing hardship, receive income support. What we do need is what Labor has been advocating for, a system that actually provides jobs and economic development in remote areas, instead of a system that has failed to do either and really unfairly penalises participants. The COVID-19 response has also highlighted the difficulties remote community residents face in accessing and affording healthy foods and other goods. With communities in lockdown, the weaknesses in supply chains have been exposed. Ironically, with families now actually more able to afford to purchase healthy food options, there have actually been less options available to them. It's not good enough that the government still wants to snap back to its old ways, to pursuing policies that punish Australians who are already facing hardship. We cannot afford to revert to the old ways, to assigning a value judgment to those receiving income support. This pandemic has been a timely reminder to all of us about the randomness of hardship, how quickly and dramatically personal and business circumstances can change. And when their circumstances do change, Australians should have the peace of mind knowing there is a strong and adequate social safety net to catch all of us. Thank you, Thank you Senator McCarthy. Senator Walters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. We simply cannot allow people to go back to living on $40 a day. We are a wealthy nation, and it is a national shame that we have people living in poverty. People should not be forced to choose between missing a meal or getting a new school uniform. Before this latest coronavirus increase, the last time government income support was lifted above inflation was 26 years ago. It was 1994, and it was raised by $2.95 a week. Is this really what the government wants to revert to? Everyone has to be supported with a livable income above the poverty line. We shouldn't choose groups that will be left behind. What the government has shown us is that there is money available to do the things that need doing. They just refused to do it before. There are plenty of ways that we could raise the necessary revenue. We could reverse stages two and three of the income tax cuts due to start in 2022 that go to the wealthiest Australians. We could end the $7 billion in public funding in subsidies to fossil fuel companies that gets doled out every single year. We could actually make gas companies pay tax and pay royalties for the gas that they currently get for free. We must ensure that everybody has access to the financial support that they need to live and the ability to provide for themselves while they are studying, caring and looking for work. In addition to supporting Australians through the recession, maintaining the rate will also boost jobs, as job seeker funding is spent throughout the economy. We estimate that increasing, uh, the increased spending unleashed by maintaining the rate would create at least 19,000 new jobs across the economy. And we need those new jobs because forecasts for the next year are grim, and young people in particular are facing the prospects of long-term unemployment and underemployment. With a million people likely to be out of work when JobSeeker is due to be halved, we need urgent action to make sure that people are kept out of poverty. The cost of putting food on the table and a roof over your head won't halve after the COVID crisis, and neither should income support. The Greens have long campaigned to raise the rate, but the government's doubling of it during the coronavirus crisis is in fact admitting that people out of work need $110 a fortnight to pay the bills and the rent. Now that we've got a more realistic rate of income support, we will campaign hard to keep it. We back the calls of thousands of Australians who are urging the government to keep the job seeker payment above the poverty line. It is unacceptable to return the job seeker rate to $40 a day, condemning over a million people to live in poverty. People on income support spend that money uh, to make sure that they're looking after themselves and their kids. Raising the rate isn't just the right thing to do for people. It's absolutely necessary to stimulate the economy. We do live in a society and not just an economy. And I think some of those examples of revenue raising, like not dishing out 
massive tax cuts to people that don't need the help, cancelling those billions of dollars of free public money to people who are polluting and wrecking the climate, and making fossil fuel companies pay their fair share is a more than adequate response in a compassionate society where we are wealthy enough to make sure that no one is left behind, no one, no child lives in poverty. It's about time this rate was retained. We welcome the fact that it has, in fact, been lifted at all. Let's now retain that rate. We cannot drop people back down to poverty just as this crisis is due to end. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, Australians have responded magnificently, working together to stay at home, observe social distancing requirements and take care of one another. But after months of being inside, isolating from friends and family, trying to balance work with the added responsibilities that come from children learning at home, Australians could be forgiven for wanting things to return to normal. But for many Australians, normal was not good. For casual warehouse workers, it meant not knowing what your wage actually would be in the following week. In many, many cases in the retail sector, it meant working in an environment where your employer was stealing your wages and doing so knowingly. For childcare workers, it meant that no matter how much you loved your job, you did it knowing that it was undervalued for the skill and care required to perform it. And for people on income support payments, it meant a daily struggle for a dignified life. People who are out of work deserve to be treated with dignity. The rate of job seeker was inadequate before this pandemic, and the government's increase to the payment during the pandemic is an admission of this fact. And the increase that's been provided means that people don't have to choose between missing a meal or missing a job interview because they don't have the money for both. It is strange indeed that the top priority for the Liberals appears to be cutting this payment. Reports are that the government wants to snap back the job seeker to $40 a day and those reports are disturbing. The latest advice from the Department of Social Services is that it believes another 400,000 Australians will require the job seeker payment by September, bringing the total number of recipients to 1.7 million Australians. This is important for those people, important for those 1.7 million people, but it is also incredibly important for the Australian economy. It is a payment that is helping to keep the economy afloat. And snapping back the payment to its old rate will be the equivalent of removing $1 billion per fortnight from the Australian economy. It will have a dire impact on small businesses. It will have a dire impact on jobs. This money is all being spent on essential services in local communities, and it has a big impact in the regions. This is a payment that means a great deal to small businesses in northern New South Wales. This is a payment that means a great deal to small businesses on the south coast, those communities ravaged by bushfires. These are payments that mean that in communities there is money available to keep businesses afloat, but also to keep people healthy and safe in their homes. So why would the government be even contemplating doing this? This is a group of people attached to their ideological ideas. This is a government that struggles, struggles to adjust to changing circumstances. We saw this in the policy proposals floated by the Treasurer in his statement today. In good times, the policy solution, tax cuts and IR reform. What's the policy solution in bad times? It's also tax cuts and IR reform. It is a policy for all seasons. There is no circumstance where the government's response will not be tax cuts and IR reform. In this policy area, the government has an obvious, sneering, ideological distaste for people who require welfare. We hear them say the best form of welfare is a job. Well, jobs are good, and we need more jobs. And these kinds of payments at a time of crisis 
support jobs. But if you ask the Australians who can't find work, they'd probably say that an unemployment payment that you can live on is also pretty good. 1.7 million Australians won't be out of work in September because they're lazy. There simply isn't the work out there. And any examination of the stats from the ABS, and in particular the underemployment figures, will show you that there hasn't been sufficient paid work in the Australian economy for some time. Yeah. The government should treat people who are out of work with dignity. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the call to retain the rate of job seeker and youth allowance. A return to the old rate of job seeker and youth allowance below the poverty line would be a colossal moral failing. The Liberals must be forced to confront the fact they are considering thrusting hundreds of thousands of Australians back below the poverty line in the middle of a crisis. This must not be allowed to happen. We must retain the rate. I particularly want to focus on students and young people. Before the rate was raised, successive Liberal and Labour governments had abandoned students to face the high cost of living and extreme stress on their own. Instead of focusing on studying, they were struggling to get by, many working multiple jobs to survive because of inadequate support. Research last year found a quarter of students were experiencing food insecurity and 15 per cent reported experiencing hunger or not eating because there wasn't enough money for food. The fundamental principle is simple. Full-time university and vocational and training students should have income support that enables them to focus primarily on their studies. While not perfect and certainly lacking on the eligibility front, the current payments are much closer to that goal than they were before. Retaining the rate is made all the more urgent by the outsized impact of this crisis um, and the impact of this crisis on young people. In the month from mid-March, 7.5% of jobs were lost to truly devastating consequences for people around the country. But for young people, it was even worse. Nearly 12% of jobs held by people aged between 20 and 30 were lost during that period and an enormous 20% of jobs held by people under 20 disappeared. Those figures are only expected to get worse. A recent Grattan Institute, Institute report found about 30% of workers in their 20s will be made unemployed by this crisis. Even once the depths of this crisis pass, young people will bear the consequences for years to come as they're confronted with decades of student debt to pay off, pay cuts on top of already flat wages and degraded workplace rights. As well as retaining the rate, we have to make sure access to income support is fair. For students, that means putting the nonsensical independence test behind us and expanding youth allowance eligibility to all students. That means ensuring eligibility for our study is expanded to all postgraduate students. That means including international students in income support just as New Zealand, Canada and other countries have done. Only by retaining the rate and expanding eligibility for income support can we keep people out of poverty and rebuild as a more socially and economically just society after this crisis? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm just getting used to the uh, new seating arrangements and it uh, feels a little bit more like a Labor Party conference with a lectern than <laughs> the Senate chamber itself. Um, I'll try and behave a little better in here than I do at those conferences. <laughs> I do want to um, take the time today uh, uh, broadly to support the comments uh, of my fellow Labor senators uh, on the MPI debate, but I do want to make a couple of comments uh, following Senator Faruqi's comments about the position of international students and the government's approach to the higher education sector more broadly uh, in the uh, coronavirus crisis uh, and in the following period. I, I walked into a food queue last week uh, of Thai uh, students organised by uh, a Thai community organisation uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Chinatown in Sydney. A hundred Thai students lined up with their bags collecting food because they couldn't afford food. There was another queue just like that uh, in Ultimo today. Uh, the university sector is Australia's third largest exporter. It's certainly the most labour intensive. 
130,000 direct workers, highly skilled people, tens of thousands more people employed as casuals, a very big employment footprint. The coronavirus crisis means in the next six months Victoria University predicts a $4.6 billion hit uh, to that sector. Uh, it's going to compound $19 billion uh, over the next three years, but there's no package. 21,000 lost jobs if action isn't taken by the federal government, but no package. Many of those jobs will be in core research areas in big cities. Thousands of them will be in regional communities uh, represented by uh, some of them by people on the other side. No package, no action. Worse still, research will stop. Classes will be cancelled. Opportunities for kids from working class families gone. It's one more example where the posturing to the base of figures on the backbench of the Liberal Party and the National Party is dictating government policy. This week it's been George Christensen running foreign policy for the government. Uh, a few weeks ago it was Senator Patterson running higher education policy for the government. Uh, he stood up reportedly in the caucus and said, with the ongoing tra China travel ban, I'm very sympathetic about the impact of tourism and farmers, but I'm less so with the universities. Uh, the universities, he said, rode the cycle up, now they can ride, ride the cycle down. Those sort of comments reflect a majority view on the other side, and it shows what a deep misunderstanding they have of the sector and its value. Fighting a culture war against imaginary people in turtleneck sweaters in, uh, in uh, uh, university English departments, well, what do universities actually do? Agricultural research, medicine, cancer, mental health, engineering, economics, uh, thinking about the future of work, research into space, defence technology, epidemiology and public health. Universities are full of experts. I understand the hostility of people on the other side of this chamber to experts, but they are experts nonetheless, the very people who the federal government relied upon to develop its COVID-19 response. And they don't just teach. They do deep research, and one of the consequences of this, of this failure to have a package, is that much of that research will stop. University research is not something that can be turned on and turned off, just like a tap. Further to this, there's this hostility from the other side to international students. Well, the truth is Australia's enormous contribution in terms of education of international students subsidises the places of Australian students at our universities. The uh, increase in international students does mean less of a Commonwealth government contribution. We should be supporting these young people uh, in this country. We've made a deep contract, not just each individual university, but as a country with the parents of these young people to educate them and to look after them. And the shameful scenes of food queues, the reports back uh, to these people's host countries will do enormous damage to the reputation of Australia as an educator uh, and as what should be a good global citizen. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ayres. I don't believe there are any more speakers on the MPI, so we'll move to um, proceed to the consideration of documents.